Hello, my name is Mark Taylor. Welcome to this three podcast network, which includes the shows Education on Fire, sharing creative and inspiring learning in our schools, Learning on Fire, Education from Sharing Wisdom, Not Testing, and the National Association for Primary Education. Find out all you need to know at educationonfire.com. There comes a time in every person's life when you realise it's not about doing what you are told, but doing what you know is right for you. Let us take a journey of learning and discovery with the world's most successful people who are living the life of their dreams, walking through life using their inner wisdom and being of service to others. Forget exams, grades and test scores. What is your purpose? As we let go of what we think should be and learn from our elders to gain knowledge, inspiration and a true sense of who we are. What are your dreams? Does your life have meaning? Are you living a life of significance? Let's talk with today's guest. Hello and welcome as we spend some more time together on the Learning on Fire podcast. Today I'm talking to Harry Horton. Hi Harry, thanks for joining me and let's explore the journey of who you are. Hi Mark, yeah it's great to be here. Um, So my name's Harry and I'm the founder and director of two organisations, Oxford Summer Courses. We run short academic residential courses in universities and the charity Universify Education which aims to expand access to higher education to those from disadvantaged backgrounds. So the thing that I was really excited about when I knew you were coming on the show was the fact that not only do you have this lifestyle where you're actually obviously doing something you're passionate about and something that you're really into but it's obviously something which is going to really really benefit those people listening who are in that kind of teenager years thinking about where they're going to be going what sorts of things they want to do and also setting themselves up for you know getting the best education they want to do so can you take us a little bit deeper into into both of those education options and the sorts of things that people could get from it sure so um i guess looking back to my own Uh, journey through. I I was lucky enough to have a very supportive um, older brother who was, I suppose, um, plowing the furrow kind of two years ahead of me and gave me lots of advice on what to do and what not to do. Uh, And I also had a a grandmother who had just retired from being a teacher when I was very young. And so I had two um, really well-informed sources of, of information to help me make the decisions of what, what I wanted to do. And I realized that, that actually a lot of people you know, aren't, aren't as lucky as that and they, they don't have a, a supportive older brother or, or grandmother or indeed you know, uh, anyone who's, who's been there and done that and can talk from personal experience about what the right options might be. So I think that's probably where the, the idea came from, particularly for, for Universify, um, which we, we kind of partner with uh, different highly selective universities and and really try and uh, show young people from across the the whole country um, who who attend non-selective state schools what university could could be for them and that it it kind of welcomes all all comers and all shapes and sizes and if you're willing to to put in a good amount of hard work then it's somewhere that you could really thrive and I guess that really is the key, isn't it? It's it's opening the door to people who think actually that's not something I could ever achieve. Well, I guess actually you've never even thought about it even being an option. Yeah, exactly. We we have many uh, boys and girls who come on the course, and you know they they might be predicted uh, very high grades in their GCSEs, but just think that oh no, I wouldn't fit in there, or that's not for me. That's not for people that you know look like me or sound like me or who are from my part of the country but actually when you when you bring bring them in we, we run residential courses it, it only takes one or two days before they feel totally relaxed totally at ease and think do you know what I could I could really enjoy myself here and, and get a lot out of it and it's, it's something we talk about quite a lot on this show is the fact that surrounding yourself with the types of people that you want to be involved in and also that you, you you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with and so if your if your background is such that you've never had that experience just all of a sudden being in that environment where you're surrounded by people who one are interested in the sorts of things that you're doing they're also experiencing this idea of maybe I could achieve x or go to the issue university or or learn in this particular way then all of a sudden your your circle of friends or your certainly your circle of influence is suddenly so much better but also much stronger and focused absolutely um 
I think one thing that we we find with the universified participants is that they they might be a bit of an outlier um, back at back at their school. You know, they're the one that does the homework or that gets the good marks or that's called the teacher's pet or, you know, that, that's slightly ostracized for doing well in, in their in their studies. But actually, when they they come and spend some time somewhere like Oxford with other you know, high, high achieving or, or motivated young people from different parts of the country. They kind of gel into this this new um, social group where everyone is is kind of supporting each other and and actually you know sharing revision tips and and different sources and books that they've read and um, you know the the WhatsApp groups that they create are incredibly um, you know incredibly supportive and and very well used. So. I think that there's there's definitely something in in that that you you take a lot of support from your your close social group and so trying to find the the right one um, makes makes a, a big difference and I think there's actually one of the huge benefits that you get from you know spending three years or, or more as an undergraduate at, at university that a lot of the argument seems at the moment to center on is it a good investment financially? Are you going to make a, a you know, a financial return on your um, nine thousand pound a year fees? But actually, I think that that misses some of the biggest gains that you get from university. You know, you you may well meet your your best friends. You may well even meet your spouse there. And um, I think that you know you can't really put a financial value on on that that kind of uh, chance meeting with um, people that will be significant to you for the rest of your life really i think that's true and it's certainly the more i've got into this podcasting world and and the communities and the online world that i sort of now find myself in while a lot of the courses that i've taken while a lot of the the trainings that i've been involved in to sort of learn this craft have been immensely important it's actually the community and the people that i've met which have had the biggest influence and, and they have a big influence day in day out because there's a question that I have or a conversation I need to have about something which I'm thinking about doing it and and that literally is priceless yeah um and I I mean for my my personal experience one of my uh, closest friends from university is my business partner and was the best man at my wedding so I think from I, I it totally chimes with me what what you're saying and how did the idea of setting up a charity come around? Well, I mean, you sort of said about the 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 background in terms of wanting to give people the the opportunity to do that. But it's one thing thinking that's a good idea; it's another to actually be in a position where you actually go out and create something like it. So, what was the process of getting into that situation? Sure. So, when I um, graduated from uh, Oxford back in 2010, I worked for a not for profit called Social Finance and. Um, I'd set up uh, Oxford Summer Courses, which was the, the kind of commercial uh, summer school providing um, short academic courses for international students. And that at the time was a bit of a, a kind of what we now call side hustle, but I, I don't know what I called it then, <laughs> just my, my evening job or my weekend job. Um, and so my, my full time work was um, with this uh, not for profit doing uh, kind of social investment work. So we uh, did different projects for charities and social enterprises, helping them come up with business plans and raise finance or build financial models for them, um, as well as sometimes partnering with uh, different government departments to help them think through um, what the the right way of um, paying for success when they wanted to um, invest in addressing a particular social issue. So I'd, I've been having these kind of two halves of my uh, professional life. One was running summer schools. The other was working with charities and social enterprises to, to come up with business plans. And so when I decided to go full time on Oxford summer courses, which was back in 2015, um, I thought I could bring these two sort of bits of experience together and uh, focus it more on um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds and see, you know, how how could we overcome uh, the barriers that students to, with um, from disadvantaged backgrounds you know, face when when applying to to top universities. I love that, and it's it's often the, the case, isn't it, where 
it's a side hustle it's something you're interested in it's something you're just doing and then over the course of time whatever that journey happens to be there's a little bit of sort of clarity that comes in and you realize that all these skills all these interests can actually then suddenly turn into something different or in terms of being expanded into something you've not thought about before and I think that's really great especially as you're growing up to sort of think that everything that you do has a real positive benefit to you even if it doesn't work in the way that you think it's going to actually all those skills are things that you can take forward in in a way that you don't actually know today necessarily. Yeah and there's um, maybe the kind of Steve Jobs example is a bit hackneyed now but um, you know, as a college dropout who decided to enroll in a calligraphy class and basically just follow his nose and follow his interests. Actually, just as you said, this kind of the stars aligned when he actually, you know, br- brought these these different bits of experience together and developed a you know computer company which had this um, sense of style and design that was just superior to anything else that was out there and and a a huge part of um, the company's success and you know you could ask whether he would have been able to to bring that that eye for design had he not you know taken an interest in in calligraphy and other other things like that so i i think it comes back to um for for students really trying to study the subject that they're they're genuinely interested in um I think a classic example is people who who study law because they want they think they want to be a lawyer but actually you know you could you could do pretty much any undergraduate subject and then do a, a law conversion and I think that that in many ways stands you in better stead because if you if you study what you really want to you'll be more passionate about it you'll be more enthusiastic you'll put in more hours you'll learn more you'll get a better degree result and yeah it just it just sets you up um to into a much better place really yeah i think that's true and i I think the same thing applies a little bit like the steve job analogy that you had is the fact that i want to be the next steve jobs well actually you don't you want to be the next harry or you want to be the next mark you know you want to be the next best version of you which only you can provide and so it's using it's using the stories of these people i think and understanding what the essence of it is and then making it your own like you said and that's that's exactly the same like I said about doing that degree that you love rather than just doing what you think you ought to do because following your passion is usually the best way to fulfilling what you need to do in your life yeah quite right I'm not um telling telling everyone that they should go and do calligraphy classes um but <laughs> but exactly that they you should find out what is the what is the equivalent for you what yeah. is that kind of like intellectual itch that you that you love to scratch and that has the potential to take you to a, an interesting place in the future. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I, I love that because that, that for me always sounds very expansive. It sounds very exciting. And I think in in, the, in this day and age of the education setup, it, it can be difficult that because there's a lot of kind of, you have to do this, you have to do that. We have to do things in a certain way. I can't be wrong. But I think when you see that standpoint we've just been talking about, about, you know, what is it I'm interested in? What do I love? I'm not quite sure where it's going to take me, but actually within it, I know it's something that sort of gets me up in the morning. And from there, you can use the, the education tools you've got the support network you've got the understanding that you've got to really combine those two things together mm, and it's not always in an easy sell this this kind of uh, broadly liberal arts approach to uh, education that I think is probably my kind of home home ground in these kind of discussions because for lots or it's a bit different in the UK versus somewhere like India for example where I think the the stats are that in the, the UK, um, 80% of graduate jobs are open to people with, with any degree. So that means unless you're doing something highly specialized, you don't really need to worry too too much about your choice of degree. Whereas in India, the kind of demographics are, are very different. And so actually they've got you know hundreds of, of applicants for each um, you know, graduate place, many who have got master's degrees and MBAs. And there's a kind of... Um, I suppose like race race to the top in terms of how many uh, degrees and can you pick up and the sort of you know how many credentials can I put on my my CV to help help me get ahead because actually there's you know a hu- huge amount uh, of kind of labour out there for for each in- individual um, job opportunity so I find that I'm kind of when making the, this sort of stance or, or making this kind of, of argument to um, Indian students and parents about the 
the value of coming over and and doing a, a short course in in Oxford and Cambridge, for example. Yeah, you ha- you have to kind of tell them about the the intrinsic value rather than it will necessarily you know you put this on your CV and it helps you get a job. Um, but a, a lot of the education debate seems to be moving towards this. Uh, how can I you know get my calculator out and, and find out whether it it gave me a few extra pounds in my you know my my graduate salary. Um, and I think that that's, that really misses a, a huge part of what's important about education, particularly what's important about higher education, um, that it, it's not all about an immediate financial return, but it's something that's, that's good to do because of, you know, the, the skills that you gain, the, the people that you meet, the experience that you have, um, and, and the kind of the amount of maturing that you can do whilst you're there. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think also the one thing we do know going forward is that even even with a highly specialised degree, even with all the credentials in the world, there is no sort of job for life now. And, and even if you're, like I said, highly specialised in a certain field, whatever that happens to be, the chances are that throughout your working life, you may end up being, you may be an employee, you may set up your own company, you may end up slightly diversifying, becoming a consultancy or anything like that. And so nothing is ever going to stay the same so all those skills you've just been talking about are absolutely essential in order to meander through exactly how life takes you forward yeah and there's there's a few kind of stats knocking around about how most people at primary school will be doing jobs that haven't been invented yet by the time that they reach the workforce so yeah i, I think the kind of transferable skills the research skills analytical skills that you would you would pick up in in higher education, I, I think uh, are particularly important. But that's that's not to say that um, that is the kind of one superior option of, above the more vocational route. And I, I think that there's definitely space within the the kind of tertiary education landscape for um, for well, particularly in this country, for much much better um, vo- vocational options. And that that you know, will build skills that are slightly more more practical and, and more immediate, but certainly not that would would necessarily go out of date with a you know kind of technological disruption. So let's let's bring this round to, to, to your um your experience um specifically and, and so what does your life look like now and how is it different from when you were growing up? Well, I mean, so I'm I'm married and I live in a, a flat with my wife, which is obviously very different <laughs> from uh, li- living at, at home under my the the iron rod of my parents. Um, no, I I guess certainly I have like much more kind of freedom and control over over what I do now. I mean, I th- think that my so I, I went to a grammar school in in Reading and um, there were lots of very talented teachers there but there, there was a huge focus on getting getting good results um, you know there was a, a reasonably kind of strict packed timetable and you know you were you were making the most of every kind of minute of, of the lesson to try and you know make as as many gains as you could before the the kind of looming exams which you always felt were were just over the horizon um, and I, I suppose the, what, the the big difference now is that in um, in running a, a company of around uh, forty people or so, that that actually um, you're you're able to set your your agenda and uh, to some extent set the yeah well set the strategic direction of the company, set you know what you want to try and achieve out of out of the week. Um, so it's yeah it's it's very different in, in terms of having a, a kind of strict timetable where you have to be here you have to be there by this time you're doing this actually you know at the start of the week it's like okay well what do i actually want to achieve out out of this week and um you know what's really going to make a difference to the performance of the the company and what support can i give to the to the senior managers to help them you know do their jobs really effectively and i think there's a really interesting thing there because you know we've talked about going through school and and focusing on results and academics and and subjects and that kind of thing but what I loved about what you just said there is the fact that an important difference is actually sometimes how do I want my life to look from a practical sense you know you know because you could have gone from school to university into some into a situation where 
actually someone else is still dictating exactly what your framework looks like and actually you've managed to find yourself in a situation where you have more control you set up your own company you do things in your way and it might just be that that's the essence as you're growing up which is the important thing you know I actually want to have control myself over my timetable or my week as opposed to being an employee and you might not know what the actual area is going to be that you're going to head in but you certainly know the type of thing and the type of setup you want to be in yeah and yeah if you're if you're someone who doesn't you know doesn't like people kind of clock watching and seeing what time you arrive at at the office and you know for one morning you might want to go for a run or you know you might want to have a lion or you might want to listen to the you know breakfast news because something really important is is happening i i very much value the the freedom that my my kind of setup has has to do that um it's not to say that when you know things things go wrong or when there's a you know a serious complaint or when there's a, a kind of hr issue or when there's a, a looming deadline you know, you, you have to kind of like dig in and particularly when a, an organization is in the kind of startup phase um, as the the kind of founder, you're, you're, you're sort of lender of last resort when um, when yeah. other people aren't, uh, are, aren't unable or, or perhaps don't have the skills or the time to do something. Often you um, you, you have to be, yeah, be the backstop and make sure that, you know, none of the, the plates get dropped. But I, th- I think that there's there's probably a well at least for for me there was this um, turning point when we were able to bring in a layer of of senior managers who were kind of experienced people and uh, to be honest quite quite a bit more I- experienced and and um, talented than me and Bob were in their particular domains and so you know it, that acts as a kind of fire blanket to to stop some of the these things um bubbling up to to us these days yeah and and that's a it's a really important factor that isn't it is to be able to actually surround yourself and employ people that are in like say more experienced or have have more insights than you in certain areas because that way you can do exactly what you said you can grow the company you can actually be the person that you were born to be as it were which is to is to found it is is to have the insights to, to see the the overview and allow the other people to do the jobs which then frees you up to do that so I, I think it's a really it's a really important factor which if you're able to put in place already is is, is going to lead to even more success yeah and i i think that there's there's something there that you know do you like kind of structure or do you like sort of freedom and then you have to find a balancing point between the two of them because um yeah too too much structure and you you kind of choke off any kind of innovation or creativity and it just feel feel like, like drudgery every day but if you don't have enough structure then you just float around and don't really focus on the things that really are important or that that make a difference um and there's certainly i think well yeah i've I found working with um, a kind of coaching style and and people that work with a sort of coaching management style w- with me, that that helps the individual sort of set specific goals and and say right the thing that's really going to make a big difference this week is if I can nail off this piece of analysis or if I can you know get this report done for for this person or if I can have a conversation with this external partner and get them to agree to work with us. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's a there's definitely definitely huge value to having uh, having focus. Um, but yeah, it's just that balancing point between some some structure to kind of keep you on it, but not too much to you know kind of stifle you and make you feel like you're you're on a conveyor belt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was valuable about your school experience? Uh, well, I I had some absolutely awesome teachers who me and my school friends who I'm you know, still very good friends with um, you know talk about uh, and do impressions of um, and I think that you know some of them did have a a big lasting um, experience on us I think that so as I say it was a kind of grammar school in in Reading and there was a a kind of culture of sort of intellectual one upmanship that you you wanted to be the person that got the top marks in the class so that you could, you know, you could rub it into your mates. It was a bit like, you know, your, your team winning uh, football at, at the weekend that it gave you the, the bragging rights. Um, and I, so I thought 
it's a bit like in the, in the history boys i think that's probably the closest like <laughs> dramatic representation and i that kind of rang very true to me um so i have a you know very close group of, of friends from my school days who we we all still uh you know kind of meet up and and, and talk about things so yes yeah, so certainly the certainly the friends and secondly that um you know that 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 drive to to want to to be the the kind of top one in in the class which i think has probably you know matured into something less uh instrumental and competitive and perhaps more uh actually you know being interested in the the underlying kind of subject matter of the things that i kind of still do uh in you know kind of research and, and take an interest in um but but finally yeah the the teachers there were there were definitely some um some really great people that um we you know we used to think you know why, why aren't they off like lecturing at uh at oxbridge or, or being a member of the the british academy they're, they're choosing to work in a, a kind of what was a temporary like, horse hut for world war Two, teaching you know a bunch of snotty nosed boys uh, maths in a in a class of 25 um but we you know at the same time we really appreciated that we we had the chance to um to learn from some really inspirational teachers um, and do you remember which those teachers were and, and why specifically they had that impact as opposed to, like say, a, any other one in any other subject? Yeah, so I think that, where would I start? Um, so Mr. Bruff, my economics teacher, he decided that he was going to uh, teach um, not just the, the whole syllabus, but kind of like 2x worth of of the syllabus so he never really needed to to worry what was actually going to be on the exams or or how the syllabus changed from one uh year to the next but he was going to um just teach us like everything that we that we needed to to know um and would would bring in kind of reams of of printouts uh particularly for our transport economics lessons um of <laughs> different like statistics and articles and I think that it was a, a combination of his enthusiasm, but also, you know, bringing in all of this uh, stuff that showed that economics was, you know, something that was happening, that was live, that was being kind of written about and talked about and discussed and, and debated, uh, yeah, and that that made a difference. Um, I, I think it helped take something that was, you know, probably pretty dry for a lot of people. This idea of the transport economics and turned it into something that you felt was very real and uh, was very immediate. And so I, I particularly remember that my other uh, favourite lesson was um, in in music. I was in quite a small class because not many of us chose to do that. And so on a, a Thursday, we had a, a coffee and cake lesson where you had to bring in um, a piece of music that you had listened to that you thought was good for a particular reason play it to everyone and then kind of do a, a sort of like live critique of it with the other people trying to, um, you know, kind of push you on your, your ideas and, uh, and challenge what you were, were talking about. So that, I think that was a, interesting for me because it was a, it felt like a very mature way of uh, having a kind of intellectual discussion about, about music amongst, you know, a group of people who were kind of like equals, including the, the teacher and that, Actually, there wasn't one person who was going to say this is the right answer and this is how you have to appreciate um, this particular piece of music. But actually, it was people offering different opinions and being able to have a, a kind of proper, like respectful intellectual discussion about it. And it does seem to be a really important factor, I think, that but both of those two elements, the that is it relevant to me or can I see how it's relevant in the real world you know like say rather than just a, a dry subject or or however that comes across and also as, as we said earlier in this in this discussion you know that the fact that relationships are important and actually to have a conversation about something you studied or to be able to put your your point of view across and have a, a sort of a to and fro conversation with other people as well because it's live it's happening in the moment it's making you think it's making you understand more it might even change your thoughts um, and I think 
that whole f- essence of you know it's in the now you know this is happening now it's a discussion that's happening now or it's a you know it's a subject which is relevant to the world at large and we can explain how that is and i think those two things that i hear it quite a lot as i chat to people now and i think it really they really are incredibly important factors Mm. And I, I think the two that I, I picked out were ones that were significant for me in, um, you know, in the kind of sick form. But but actually, a lot of it is built on the the kind of basics of just you know, learn, learning learning the basics, the the kind of bread and butter, the the subject knowledge that um, you you kind of need to be able to to have those sort of. Um, higher order conversations and I think that that that's often something that that gets overlooked uh, you know if you, when you're in year seven year eight year nine and, and actually it's a little bit more you know you just need to kind of teach the you know the, the bread and butter subject knowledge um, and I think that that it's almost like you're kind of eating your greens you know you, you don't necessarily particularly appreciate it at, at the time but it's actually quite quite important um, in the more of the the long term to to enable you to to then move on to the the higher order um, conversations later on. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think it is also keeping it relevant. So, so that you've got something to attach that to, isn't it? I mean, I just thought as a musician myself, you know despite the fantastic experiences I've had on concert stages and in theatres. I do remember those hours and hours and hours in a practice room just doing relentless repetition scales or rhythms or whatever it happens to be. And without those, I couldn't have done the other things. But it it was the fact that within that, there was still concerts, there were still things, there were still performances, there were still things while you're doing that bread and butter stuff that just made you think, oh yeah, despite the fact, like you say, I know I'm into my greens, I know it's doing me some good, but I can just get an essence of that to sort of keep pushing in that direction. And I think I think that's a really, yeah, really important factor. Being able to visualise a, a goal at, at the end of, you know, the, the number of hours of kind of hard work and you know, deliberate practice uh, is really important as a motivating kind of factor. You know, if you can see in your mind's eye yourself up on stage giving a, you know, a, a faultless performance, it, it, um, you know, you can kind of fix on that, and all of the all of the hard work seems like it's it's moving somewhere. Whereas if if you flip that round and there's no there's no end goal, there's no concert, there's no real like reason for for doing it all, then yeah, then it, it's it's way less motivating, and you think uh, actually I just I'll play a, a few of my my favourite tunes, um, and I won't you know attend to the bits that I, I find most difficult, and then actually need to work on in order to improve my technique. Yeah, and and I think something that's just struck me there as well is the fact that these these goals and 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 what you're studying for. I think the time scale changes as you get older because of course if you think all the way back to primary school you know your world is very very much smaller it's all about you know very much today tomorrow you know next week you know and that kind of thing it's only when you start to say as you get into maybe year eight year nine year ten year 11 and you're talking about sick form you know you start to get the the breadth of everything and, and you understand the work that you've done and how that goes forward and how the goals can be that little bit further forward and so I think not giving yourself a hard time just remembering where you are in that landscape of of experience you know so that actually things are different in year seven even to year nine and actually just giving yourself that sense of it's hard to understand it when you're in the middle of it but I think that's the, well, that's the reason I think these conversations are so important is the fact that those people that are getting that opportunity a little bit like your courses you know you don't quite know what it's involved until you have a go and you, you have that experience and then you start to see that bigger picture and that's why getting yourself out there and getting as much information as you can is, is really important. Yeah, and it's why Universify works with year 10s who are going into year 11, because the whole aim of it is about helping more of these young people get, you know, good good university outcomes. We, we, we work much earlier than, than lots of the, the other stuff that's out there that, that takes people at year 12. And by then, the kind of the battle has, has largely been um, fought and won or, or lost. But actually... Um, when you're when you're working with year tens, you can really give them a, a huge amount of motivation by 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 showing them what the the goal could be. So, you know, particularly through the use of like residential uh, summer courses, you you bring them into the university and say, 
look, this is what what life could could be like if if you want to work hard and you know do well at your exams. Um, and so lots of them go back home really fired up, um, and they've got a really clear vision of you know of why they they want to work hard, of why they they want to you know do that extra early morning maths class in order to to get the grades up because they see where it, where it's heading. And it's not just you know get good grades because you have to. It's uh, you know you, you see that as a as a stepping stone towards something much bigger that you that you really want to achieve. So yeah, I, I think the the kind of early intervention aspect is is particularly important, and and, and that's why we wanted to to start off working with um, young people as early as we could. Yeah, I really like that idea, and I, and I think that. I mean, having had two children now that have gone through that kind of age barrier, there is a sense of primary school into secondary school. It, you know, once they get adjusted to the, the fact that it's a different environment and moving around classes and all that kind of thing, you've sort of got seven, eight, nine, and then it's kind of ah, oh, right, yes, year ten. Now all of a sudden, we really are on that path of you know exams are on the horizon you know I'm studying things because I've chosen to as well as obviously the the mandatory things as well and I, I think to really have a that point of been actually a bit of focus and understanding I think like you said it it might be a bit earlier than some scenarios but I think it's a really integral one to people's success yeah we, we had this um amusing uh <laughs> sort of lecture assembly that happened each year at, at school, uh, which I remember. Um, in year seven, they said, look, this is this is secondary school. This is, you know, proper stuff now. You can't, you know, you can't coast. You, you've really got to kind of work hard. And then in year eight, they said, well, year seven, that was a transition year. You know, you, you get the first one free. But this year, you've, you know, year eight, you've properly got to work hard now. And then year nine, I think it was, uh, sats or uh, and then they did this every, uh, this this talk got wheeled out every year why this was really the important year that you you had to to focus on um and i think that the one around year 10 was well this is the start of your um you know the kind of runway towards uh, towards gcse so that's why uh, that was particularly important but i i generally do think there is is something in that that because the way that the admission system works now with you know GCSEs being the the only real concrete um, grades that you will then uh, make an application to, to university for it, it kind of really puts additional importance on on, on what you're able to, to get in that uh, and, and also of course because it then determines what what subjects you'd be able to do at a level so I, I think that you know it's a kind of um, as an important year, as an important um, kind of transition period, um, there's there's some good research out there uh, why I suppose kind of uh, socially and, and biologically perhaps that 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 age might might be important. But I think for the way that our kind of current system works, it's you know it's about that that runway towards GCSEs. Who did you admire when you were young, and what was it about that person that had such an impact? Well, I mentioned my my brother at, at the start, and he's definitely been a, a big uh, impact on me. I, I think um, for many reasons. One that uh, he would be slightly better than me at, at all of the family board games. I think because he was a couple of years older, and I always wanted to uh, win at those those family board games. But but actually, as we as we got older, I realised that he was particularly interested in a lot of the the same things that, that I was around you know, politics and economics and philosophy. And I used to kind of borrow his books that he would be you know he would be very keen to to lend them to me and then have a, a kind of conversation about it and find out what what I thought. But in a very kind of intellectually generous way, never trying to you know score a point if I didn't understand something or I didn't get something right, but actually to try to you know help help me understand things and and help me get into it and get excited about it. So I think both that being sort of highly intelligent but also very very generous uh, intellectually, I, I think is a really important combination and, and something that. Um, I massively admire. 
I think that's fantastic. I think you're the first person who's ever had a sibling is the person that they'd admired when they were young. And and I and it and the siblings have such a big impact as as you said and and often for negative reasons as well as positive reasons depending on how you get on and and that kind of um like you say wanting to be the best and that kind of thing and it obviously depends on your relationship but I I think no matter how you get on with a sibling the fact that they're with you so in close proximity like say it may be in age or and certainly in terms of your education experience it, yeah such a big impact and I, and I love that yours was such a positive one and and so um and so supportive yeah and it actually came well into the oxford summer courses and university experience as well because um so my my brother george uh, was a uh, an academic at oxford um whilst i was setting up oxford summer courses and so uh, he helped us sign up lots of tutors and he um, looked after the, the academic uh, side of the, the program for um, a few years over the, the summers when he wasn't teaching. Um, and then he was a founding trustee of Universify as well. Um, he's, he's since stepped down. Um, but he, he's been kind of influential in the, the two organizations as well as being um, influential when I was younger as well. What was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? I think it comes back to this thing about following your interests and your your passions and, and not worrying about what other people tell you you, you should do or, or what you think you, you have to do um, in order to, you know, to, to please X, Y, Z or, or get a certain job outcome uh, in, in the future. Um, and it was one of my uh, former teachers. It was Mr. Holt, who was our head of sixth form at Reading School. Um, and it was the the biggest piece of advice that he he gave us when trying to select a, a university. But I think it it's not just about um, it doesn't work just in an education setting, but I, I think in a in a kind of job setting in a you know who who do you uh, spend your time with as your as your friends or you know who do you find as a partner you, you have to be true to yourself because if you if you don't that that will end up uh, I think coming out sooner or later and, and make you unhappy what advice would you give your your younger Harry self um, if you were sort of looking back and, and, and sort of being that mentor um, giving that advice back to your younger person I would probably tell myself that I didn't have to be as competitive as I, I thought I had to be. I, th- I think that young, younger Harry thought that he had to succeed by, uh, by doing better than, than everyone else. And actually what I would say is that, you know, just do, do as well as, as you can and you'll be absolutely fine. You don't need to worry about doing better than, but just do, you know, as, as good a, a job as possible. I think that's great advice. I, th- I think that being the best you rather than being a better person in someone else is always going to stand you in good stead because, of course, the only thing you have control over is yourself. And um, and so, like I say, while being able to sort of support and, and help each other in terms of moving forward and that, maybe that competitive element to some degree, it's, it's that element of yourself which is really important. I, th- I think that's really, really great advice. What does your future look like? Well, I would. I'm hugely enjoying my my two projects at the moment, which are Oxford Summer Courses and, and Universify. And I think that there's a lot that these two organisations can do. And, and I'm you know hugely excited about being a big part of that. Um, on the Oxford Summer Courses side, I think the thing that will really make a big difference is if we can work out how to bring a similar kind of value to our in-person um, courses, but but do this online. Um, I mean, having run, we, so we run courses for about 2,000 odd people who who fly in from different parts of the, the world to study in uh, mainly Oxford and Cambridge and London. Um, so they fly in for two weeks and then they, they go back off to different parts of the world. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't take a, a genius to work out that this from a, from an environmental sustainability perspective, isn't necessarily the best thing for the planet. We we do carbon offset all of the flights, but uh, thinking long term, is this really you know growing growing that particular mode of of, of study? Is is that really going to be a big growth area? 
actually, I, I think what's really exciting and interesting is can can you bring similar kinds of learning gains, but but do it online so that students don't necessarily have to leave their country or indeed even their even their home in order to um, get a, a similar kind of learning experience. Um, so that's something that we're, we're putting in a lot of time and effort and resources into trying to develop. Um, and I think that, yeah, I'd, I'm very, very excited to be a part of that. Well, I, I think maybe our conversation today is um, is an integral part of understanding that, isn't it? You know, we're not in the same place. We're talking over the Internet. And yet the, the value that you're able to give everybody who's listening is as great as it would have been if maybe we were in the same room but they could be listening all over the world just through whatever app they use for a podcast and i think yeah is a is a way as the planet moves forward in the sorts of ways we want to do it then yeah i think that thinking is, is a very strong one yeah and it, it's how do you how do you get people to feel like they're they're in a class and and have that connection with with the teacher and not get distracted by by other things that you might well have in your you know in your study or your front room or your, on your computer but but to to feel like you're you're in the classroom and you have a connection to the teacher uh, and that you're you know have that kind of cohort vibe of of, of being in a, a class and studying with with other people and getting other perspectives because i think just putting content on online that people can sort of passively take in isn't really going to to do the trick i think there has to be human interaction in there in in order to um get people's attention and to have some kind of back and forth so that you know you can you can ask questions and you can you know clarify things and you can focus in a little bit on the parts that you maybe didn't understand as well and so it's it's how do you how do you have that that human interaction but also a model that that's scalable because you know the the human interaction requires hum, humans which is more difficult to to scale than a, a purely um tech based solution where you know you can um just give many more people access to the the same platform so that's the kind of the question that we're currently um thinking about is how do you how do you square that circle yeah yeah it's, it's a really interesting one isn't it i know when we were chatting to melissa webb um on our english um podcast season on education on fire it was it was her online platform was was based around zoom calls and and the fact that there was this interaction there was backwards and forwards there was a study they'd done that they were bringing to their particular class online and i think she even said that they had like almost like a a classroom play area before they even started where you could come online and just chat and, and talk about what you've been up to before and we sort of gave that sort of community and, and that sort of social element to it but as you said there's one of her and however many people that she has within her class but if you've got many thousands of people doing that then of course as you said the scale option is is, is harder to do but i'm i'm i'm, I'm sure with the the ethos and, and the understanding that you've got you'll manage to like you say manage to get that square peg in a round hole in a very successful way yeah i, th I think that there's definitely ways that technology can help and having a a, a sort of a blended model um that that's using you know kind of online content plus classes plus you know tutor-led bits plus live lectures perhaps and and yeah i suppose it's about trying to get like a a good number of um high quality teachers on your your book so that you can you know book them into the right times of the day so you can serve time zones across uh you know across the whole world but it's it's an in, a very interesting challenge we certainly uh, have not yet arrived on on the the solution that's going to change the world yet but um but but we'll work on it and finally what podcast book video film song or resources had the biggest impact on your life and why was that so i absolutely love listening to free economics um i think that they have some really um interesting speakers and they they've done a, a big series on kind of behavior change and growth mindsets and they they get in all of the the leading researchers to um, explain the experiments they've done, explain their kind of research methodology, um, what you can take from it, uh, from a both from a sort of academic perspective, but also from a you know individual perspective. Like how how do you get 
uh, as an individual. I think they did an episode. It's like how how to become amazing at anything, and it's like you know who who wouldn't want to know to know that really? But I I think it's a good mixture of um, being kind of entertaining and 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 kind of holding your your attention, but also you know smuggling in a bit of um, economics and uh, and psychology or, or science in there, so that you you're actually getting something from it um so i yeah i i in, enjoy that a lot and for those people who are excited about exactly what it is that you've set up and and, and the, the great value that you're providing what's the best way for people to find out more about it yeah so we've we're, we're online it's um oxford summer courses if you you google it um and university education.com um and you'll 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 see it all there or um uh, I'm Harry Horton, and you, you can find me on LinkedIn, which is where I post all of my um, musings and, and company information. So, you know, happy to to hear from um, listeners who uh, you know who are interested in the same things that we've been talking about. Really great, and we'll have links to all of these on the show notes for this particular episode on educationonfire.com, so you can have have a one stop all the way through and just click through to get all that information. So, well, thank you, Harry, for sharing your wisdom and allowing us to learn from your experiences. Brilliant. I've I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Learning on Fire podcast. For more information, please visit educationonfire.com and follow the links from the homepage. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.